Welcome to Accessible Art History, the podcast, the best place for art history lovers or anyone that is curious. My name is Annalisa, and I'm here to share an incredible work with you. Just a quick reminder before we get started. All sources and images will be posted on the Accessible Art History blog. You can find the link in the episode description as well as on our Instagram at accessible.art.history. Now that we have that out of the way, let's get started. This week, I'm shifting away from Rococo to a style that is often considered to be its polar opposite. Neoclassical art came as a direct response to the Rococo, and it's quite a dramatic change. To illustrate this, I'm going to be discussing Jacques-Louis David's work, The Oath of the Horashi. It was painted in 1784 and represents a legend about the 7th century BCE war between Rome and the Alba Longa. David used this story to highlight the themes of patriotism and sacrifice. It was an instant hit with critics and remains one of the artist's most popular works to this day. So to learn more about it, then keep on listening. Before I dive into description of this work, I think it's important that I cover the story that it depicts. It's the 7th century BCE, and Rome is at war with the neighboring city-state of Alba Longa. Both sides decided to send three men to fight instead of risking the lives of many more. The Romans sent three brothers from the Horashi family, and Abalanga sent three from the Curitai family. The Romans won, but at a great cost. Only one brother survived the fight. David used books by Livy and Dionysus' book Roman Antiquities as his main source. The story represents the idea of self-sacrifice for the greater good, an idea held close during the neoclassical period. This work depicts the moment that the three Horashi brothers pledged to fight for Rome, They are dressed in military garb and perform a salute. Fun fact, this is where the popular trope comes from that we still see in the media today. Their father, dressed as a senator, holds up their swords to represent their commitment. On the right hand of the scene, there is a group of women looking sad at the events unfolding. One of them is crying. Her name is Camilla. She's not only the sister of the Harashi brothers, but she's engaged to one of the Kiritati fighters. Her tears represent the fact that she's going to lose someone she loves in this battle. David chose to depict this work inside a traditional Roman house. The rounded arches and lack of decoration are stark, centering the focus on the scene at hand. The location isn't what's important, it's the vow. However, there is very little emotion. Yes, the viewer can grasp the tension and sadness, but each figure is still composed. This isn't the overtopped dramatics of the previous Baroque period. The artists utilize strong, clean lines in this piece. There is no haziness. Instead, each detail is crisp. The main line is a strong diagonal coming from the Roman salute. This creates a dignified and solid composition. All of these elements combine to create a work about patriotism and self-sacrifice. As I mentioned before, this work is part of the neoclassical style. It developed as a direct response to the emotional and gaudy works of the Baroque and Rococo periods. Artists wanted to express the ideas of honor, virtue, clear gender roles, and rationality, all things that were valued in the classical past. The top types of painting in this period were biblical and history paintings. They were used to glorify the past. But how did this style develop? Besides being a dramatic shift from the previous styles, there were several other factors. The first was the discovery of the archaeological sites of Pompeii and Herculaneum. These two cities are located near modern-day Naples and were buried during the eruption of Mount Vesuvius in August of 79 CE. They were found between the end of the 17th century and the mid-18th century. The volcanic ash had created the perfect environment for preservation, opening up a world long forgotten. I did do a podcast episode on the paintings of Pompeii, so make sure to check it out. I've linked it in the description below. In order to see these ruins, wealthy individuals would embark on a grand tour. They would travel around Italy and Greece to see historical sites and learn about ancient societies. It was quite fashionable and opened up their eyes to new ways of thinking. Another major influence on the development of neoclassical art was a man named Johann Joachim Winkelmann. He was a pioneer of art history and archaeology, and is responsible for much of our understanding of classical art and architecture. Winkelmann is often considered the modern father of art history, and his writings were quite popular at this time. Next, I'm going to discuss David and the politics of 18th century Europe, but let's take a quick break first. Now 
now that we're back, let's dive into the life of Jacques-Louis David, who was born in 1748 to a wealthy family in Paris. Although his father died when he was young, his uncles ensured that he was well taken care of and that he was sent to the top schools. However, David was not academically inclined. He preferred to spend his days drawing. After he finished his schooling, David worked with artist and distant relation Francois Boucher. He worked hard to get noticed by the Royal Academy and was eventually admitted to study there. David then sent his sights on the winning the Prix de Rome. This was a prestigious prize that included a full scholarship to study in the Eternal City. It took him several years, but David won in 1774. This would have a profound impact on his art. He studied the artists of past periods and the ruins of the city. David also read Winkelmann's books, becoming infatuated with the history of Rome. When he returned, David got caught up in the politics of the French Revolution. He was close friends with Robespierre and even voted for the execution of King Louis XVI. Some historians are surprised by this, as he had many commissions from the noble class and had profited quite well. One explanation is that he was inspired by the ideals of the Roman Republic and hoped the same would happen in his home country of France. His art caught the eye of Napoleon, and David continued to have a successful artistic career under his imperial regime. Napoleon also tapped him for government work. David's luck ran out, though, when the Bourbon royal family took back power. He was exiled to Brussels. He died there in December of 1825, sadly a few days after he was struck by a carriage. Today, David is remembered as the top artist of this period. Some of his other famous works include The Death of Morat, The Intervention of the Saving Women, and Napoleon at the St. Bernard Pass. During David's lifetime, Europe was in a constant state of upheaval and change. It was the time of the Enlightenment, which represented a change in thought. The Industrial Revolution was just kicking off, changing the global economy forever. The American Revolution was just wrapping up. This war changed the idea of politics across the world, not just between North America and Great Britain. These changes were a shifting force, just like the rise of ancient Rome. It must have been an exciting time to live in. This work fits perfectly within this time period. It represents the idea of self-sacrifice for the state and growth as a nation. This idea started in England during the Glorious Revolution and it quickly spread through the continent. National pride combined with the ideas of liberty and freedom of the American Revolution and a passion from the classical past. This is what fueled the neoclassical era. The Oath of Arashi is an assertive statement of self-sacrifice that encompasses the ideals of the neoclassical movement. Make sure to tune in next week when I cover another neoclassical piece, Venus Victress by Antonio Canova. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Accessible Art History, the podcast. Make sure you follow us on Instagram at accessible.art.history for updates and keep an eye out for our next episode. They drop every Monday on your favorite podcast platform.